I'm Matt Picardle, a licensed civil structural engineer, and I'll be talking about the Baltimore Bridge Collapse from a general engineering perspective and answering questions such as how are bridges engineered to handle impacts from cargo ships? How much impact force did the ship hit the bridge with? Why the way the bridge collapsed was an engineer's worst nightmare? And essentially, what does this mean for bridge design in the future? To be honest, I don't like talking about these types of collapses because first and foremost, they're tragedies. People lost their lives and or are missing and the rescue efforts come first. My thoughts and prayers go out to them and it seems like it was a freak accident and we can count our blessings that it was in the middle of the night where there wasn't a lot of traffic. If it helps people to feel safer and have a better understanding and appreciation of what goes into the structures that they use every day, then sure, I'll talk about it. As a structural engineer, I designed the skeletal system of buildings so they stand up and don't fall down during heavy winds or earthquakes. But I don't specialize in bridges personally. So my viewpoints are from a general engineering perspective, explaining the basic structural engineering principles and design philosophies that we use as structural engineers. When I first saw the footage of the collapse, one of the first structural things that jumped out at me was, holy crap, that cargo ship is almost as big as that bridge. And as it hit the bridge, I wasn't that surprised that it collapsed because that impact force was going to be massive. How massive? Well, going back to some basic physics, force equals mass times acceleration, or F equals MA. Some rough estimates for the weight and mass of those types of ships are around 100 to 150 tons, and that's huge. That's about half the weight of the Empire State Building. The acceleration, there are some estimates of around six knots or 7.8 miles per hour, but we can't just plug and chug those numbers into the equation because it takes a few seconds for the ship to completely stop accelerating, making the equation more complicated. So just based on some experiments and lab testing, engineers came up with a more simplified formula that's found in the bridge design codebooks. Let's just plug in some of the numbers and a rough estimate of the impact force comes in at around 25 million pounds or 12,500 tons or about the weight of 100 blue whales. And that's a massive load to put on any structure. So are bridges designed for ship impacts? Yes, just as you saw, there are impact loads in the bridge design codebooks. The big question is, what's the maximum force or what maximum ship size should the bridge be designed for? Engineers aren't just going to put the heaviest load they can possibly imagine in there. The design needs to be safe but efficient. For extreme events such as these, engineers rely on probability-based approaches. What's the probability of a Dolly supersized ship going under the bridge back in the 70s? probably close to zero since ships were much smaller back then, so the engineers wouldn't design for that big of an impact. For example, in building earthquake design, we don't design buildings for the largest earthquake we can possibly imagine. We don't design for 12.0 earthquakes. If we did, no one would have the money to construct them. So instead, we take a probabilities-based approach. We design buildings so they have only a 1% chance of collapsing from an earthquake in the next 50 years. I imagine bridge engineering, it's something similar. So the engineers probably designed it back then for collisions, but for collisions from supersized cargo ships, they probably weren't. So if bridges back then weren't designed for these supersized cargo ships, what does that mean for older bridges, such as the Golden Gate Bridge that was built in the 30s? Are those safe? For these bridges, there's usually a sort of crash barrier around the bridge piers to prevent ships from colliding into them in the first place. The Golden Gate Bridge is protected by a concrete fender ring that's 40 feet deep and is filled with sand to act as that crash barrier. Other types of barriers include dolphins, which are often steel cylinders filled with concrete that are attached to the seafloor, designed to absorb impacts and divert ships away from the bridge piers. So even if older bridges weren't designed for these massive collision loads, there's always ways to protect them. And if existing bridges don't have that collision protection around them, this incident will make sure they do. I've also thought about instead of having crash barriers around the piers, what if these large ship vessels had crash barriers built structurally into them? What if they had a crumple zone built into them similar to cars? 
the crumple zone is the front area of your car that is specifically designed to crush or crumple during impact. The crushing in the crumple zone will absorb a lot of impact energy from a collision, acting as a cushion, reducing the damage to the piers. I'm no ship engineer, but that seemed like a cool idea. The next structural thing that came to mind when I was watching the footage was the way the bridge collapsed. It was pretty horrifying. I mean, as a structural engineer, that's our worst nightmare, seeing our structure completely collapsing in one go. We don't want them collapsing that way, especially for essential structures such as these. If a structure does collapse from extreme unexpected events, we'd want it to at least collapse in segments, not the entire bridge at once. Structural engineers call this a progressive collapse, where if one part of the bridge collapses, it doesn't take the rest of the bridge with it. In this bridge example, the bridge deck intentionally has weaker joint connections to the bridge piers. So if the bridge piers are lost, it only collapses a portion of the deck. The rest of the bridge stays standing. This is a progressive collapse that engineers prefer. The Francis Scott Key Bridge, though, had a design where it was rigidly connected throughout because of its steel truss design. For our bridge model, we're going to add in joint stiffeners to replicate these rigid connections. Now, if we lose the bridge piers, the deck collapses, but since the deck is stiffly connected to the rest of the bridge, it takes the rest of the bridge down with it. This is something that I'm sure will be further studied by the bridge engineering community because of this disaster. The lessons that we learned through this will hopefully ensure that the bridges we use every day will continue to remain safe. Make sure to check out these other videos where I simply explain how engineers design buildings for winds and earthquakes and what the deadliest buildings are in an earthquake. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.